as pseudo-humans in order to have such relationships. But if social relations so readily override the boundaries of species as these hunters maintain, then the sociobiological restriction of sociality to relations among conspecifics makes no sense at all. For them, interpersonality, person to person, not intraspecificity, individual to individual within a species, is the mark of the social. And what species uh, the person belongs to is, to some extent, superficial. But by and large, Western analysts have taken a pretty dim view of the claims of hunters or of indigenous peoples more generally to relate on a person-to-person -person basis with non-human animals. Nick Humphrey, for example, to go back to his original paper, argues that when people apply an intelligence fashioned by natural selection for dealing with social partners to other kinds of entities in the environment, they are bound to make mistakes. Such applications are examples of what he calls the fallacious reasoning in which primitive and not-so-primitive people indulge. In doing so, says Humphrey, they are explicitly adopting a social model, expecting nature to participate in the transaction, but nature will not transact with men. She goes her own way regardless. Now, in anthropology, this allegedly fallacious reasoning to which primitive people are susceptible has traditionally gone by the name of magic. And in his classic work on the Trobriand Islanders, entitled Coral Gardens and Their Magic, one of the great anthropological classics, comes from 1935, Bronislaw Malinov Malinowski offered this wonderfully pithy formulation of what goes on in magical performance. Words which are meant for things that have no ears fall upon ears they are not meant for. His point was that magical incantations, although supposed to exert a direct effect on the things of nature to which they are addressed, and in the Trobians it's often plants, you know, plant, grow, telling the plant to grow um, in some magical formula. The plant hasn't got any ears, it doesn't hear anything. But the, these words that are, that, that are supposed to have a direct effect on the thing of nature actually work their effects on any human listeners who happen to be within earshot. And that it was in terms of these latter effects that the real power of magic has to be understood. But taking Malinowski's observation at face value, it would seem that the significant distinction is not between persons and non-human things, but rather between beings with ears and beings without. And one's reminded of the classical Roman author Varro, who distinguished among slaves, domestic animals, and inanimate instruments on the grounds that the first were vocal, the second semi-vocal, and the third mute. The animal kingdom is, of course, replete with species that employ vocal communication and whose sense of hearing is often highly developed, more developed than ours on some registers. And individuals of these species can and do respond in more or less intentional ways to human calls. If there's anything odd about the sort of performance designated as magical, it's just that action is presented in a sensory register alien to that of the being addressed in it. So, are we to conclude that social interactions are interactions among hearing beings? Well, such a restriction would be both arbitrary and absurd. It would, for example, exclude the deaf. And even for people with normal hearing, it would artificially isolate one modality, the vocal auditory, from all the other modalities of action which may just as well involve body posture, manual gesture, facial expression, touch, or all at once. There's no necessary reason, therefore, why the domain of the social should be open only to beings with ears, let alone to human beings in particular. On the contrary, since hearing, seeing, touch, posture, gesture, and so on are all forms of movement, the social should be open to all beings that move and that, being endowed with perceptual systems, respond to each other's movements. Or in a word, it should be open 
to all animate beings. Or in short, to be social is to be alive, alive both in and to the surrounding environment. Different beings, of course, have different sensibilities and capabilities of action, and in our dealings with them, we, are ordinarily, we ordinarily adopt those sensory registers that are appropriate in each case. But there's no register that escapes the domain of our sensory involvement in our environment. No discourse that doesn't subsist in the process of our bodily dwelling. So if some relations are social, then all are, and all life will be social life. So you might wonder, what need do we have of a concept of the social at all? And indeed, at one stage, I thought we might as well dispense with it, that we don't need it. We just talk about life, full stop. But to answer this question, well, what need do we have of the social? We need to return to the second misconception that I ad identified in the formulation of the social brain hypothesis. You'll remember that the first is, just to recapitulate the argument, is that it sets up a false opposition between social and ecological relations. That is, in terms of the hypothesis, between relations between individuals of the same species and relations between individuals of different species. Even if we accept the idea that the brain is an internal information processor that manipulates and orchestrates the individual's conduct in the external domain of social interaction, we would still have to admit that the portfolio of any individual's relationships would include a great deal more than relationships with conspecifics. So what's the point of saying you know, that humans can manage in groups of 150, given the fact that humans are managing with a whole lot of beings of all sorts beyond that, uh, we've never even begun to enumerate. And that at once invalidates Dunbar's idea of the group size bottleneck. However, it is precisely the assumption that the brain is an information processor that we now have to question. That's the second thing wrong with the social brain hypothesis. Adhering to what's commonly called the theory of mind approach, Dunbar assumes that the job of the mind brain is to construct internal representations of what are supposed to be or inferred to be the states of mind of others so that one can both predict their likely actions and calculate how best to act towards them. So it's assumed that every actor is acting on the basis of an internal state of mind in order to work out how to act towards you. I've got to figure out what's in your mind and so then I can figure out how best to respond to what you're going to say to me. And it goes backwards and forwards in this complicated thing. They even talk, you know, you get these discussions about nth order, to seventh, eighth, ninth order intentionality in which I act in order to my construction of what you're thinking about, me thinking about you, thinking about me, thinking about you. And you think, what world are these people living in? Anyway. <laughs> But in this approach, there, there's a, a, a hard and fast boundary between mind and world, and that boundary surrounds the individual actor. So it's the temptation whenever you say, here is a person, here is an actor, here is an individual, what do you do? You draw a circle. Okay, there is, there is a person, mind inside, maybe in a box, world outside. And there's this big, hard boundary because you can't know anything about what's out there unless you've reconstructed it in here. We're quite familiar with that picture. It's been very deep-seated in, in, in psychology. So the mind is on the inside processing information about the external world in which the mind's outputs are implemented and have effects. So rather ironically, Dunbar's social brain is unequivocally individual and not social. It might be social in its functions or in its effects, but it is individual in its constitution and its mode of existence. It is quite unequivocally in here, whereas the social stuff is going on out there. So that's to say, in its architecture and its properties, the so-called social brain 
is constituted